Please join me in welcoming Anthony Watt. Thank you, team. Good morning, Canberra. Special uh, welcome to our delegates at the conference, the 21st Canberra Conference. Members from government, our speakers today, Microsoft, the chief, uh, chief speakers of security from New South Wales. Also a special tribute to Mike Hitchie, who's come all the way from Ireland. Mike is the president of the IFIP, the International Federation for Information Processing, uh, that we are part of, of 50 computer societies around the world. Mike is uh, on the circuit with me this week, next week. Uh, you may know that next week we have the AI Festival in Melbourne. Uh, we have the International AI Conference coming to Melbourne starting from Tuesday. Uh, so it's a whole week of uh, AI Conference. So. So today I could see that's the start of the AI Festival starting in Canberra. So thank you, uh, Canberra Branch, for inviting me to be uh, here today to speak to you about automation and work. So I'm going to talk. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to talk about five areas in very quick succession, 20 minutes. So. I don't want to take you a lot of time. I just want to take you quickly to automation and robots, and I'm going to look at how it's going to impact the workforce, the ICT profession, and then looking into the future. But before I start, I'd just like to talk about quickly about in terms of robots. We're familiar with the culture about robots. Robots not new. We had many movies in the past, uh, ranging from iRobots to Act Machina to Terminator by Sentinel Man. We talked about the different types of robots and how it's evolved over the number of years. We also, back in the early 18th century, we have this automated robotic swarm which is now in the museum in England. It's built in 1773. So the idea of robots is not new. If you go to YouTube, you can actually see the swan moving and catching a fish from the pond. Um, so you can see that on the video. So with is that we currently going through in the last 20 years, I'm just going to do a test before I start. Uh, there's, do you recognize some of those phrases coming from famous movies of the last 10, 20 years? Who wants to have a go? The very first bullet points. Robots may not injure a human being, although through an action allow a human being to come to harm. Which movie is that come from or which book? Does anybody know? Tim. That's right, so thank you, Tim, for that. What about talking about robots? They have a plan. Which movie is that from? Robots, they have a plan. So these are some of the answers from some of the movies that we have. So that was Better Star Galactica. So where the robots were shown to take over the world. So these are some of the famous movies that we have in recent times. So where we are at now, if you look at the four columns, we are moving towards the right, where artificial intelligence will start to mimic human beings. So where are we currently in this evolution? I think we are somewhere here where robots now have cognitive automation functions. We're starting to utilize some of these features on this, but whether we can get to the end, that's the question. There's a lot to talk about as we go through my slides this morning. Tim mentioned about Elon Musk. Just two days ago, he talked about that AI is more dangerous than North Korea. You all probably heard about North Korea. But this was a tweet that he did two to three days ago. And he mentioned in the end, the machines will win. 
So he, with his counterpart, like Stephen Hawkins, have been talking about the dangers of robots. But I'm not here to talk about that today, nor on the questions of ethics, because with Mike Inchi, we're going to cover that in Melbourne on Thursday and, and on the panel on the Industry Day on Friday. So there's a lot of debate going on about the benefits of AI and where are we going to AI and what's going to happen to us if we move down this track with AI. So from Elon Musk, he talks about AI is a fundamental risk. It's a fundamental risk to the existence of human being. Do you think that would come true? If you look at some of the features, some of the benefits, some of the characteristics of robots and AI, they work 24 by 7. They don't get paid. They don't have salaries. So if robots take over the world, who's going to pay taxes to fund all these projects that we have in the country around the world? Because robots do not get a salary. They don't get paid. They don't take breaks. So some of the features we've already seen in the world today, real cases. So recently, being a lawyer, instead of going to Google to find out some answers to a state of facts that I need to know, I talked to Siri. I wanted to know where Toronto in Canada was based, in which state, because as a lawyer, I'm drafting a contract to find out which law would apply to a server base in Toronto. In order to do so, I need to find out the state that Toronto is based in Canada. So I asked Siri for the first time a very serious question. I said, Siri, good morning. I said, which state is Toronto based in Canada? And to my shock horror, Siri came back and said Ontario very quickly. So that was amazing to me because I've never done that before. And this is what's happening now with chatbots. So if you look at chatbots, even with your IP Australia website, just two days ago, I went to the website to ask a question as an IP lawyer. I said, in Australia, under patent law, are you allowed to patent innovations in food? And I, I'll ask Alex, who's on the website for IP Australia. And Alex gave me a correct answer. So even in my area of work as a lawyer, we're looking, looking at chat box in the things we do to answer questions. And that's happening across the board with medical, with IBM Watsons, and many, many other technology. So these are but some of the examples of where AI now being used today in real life applications. But to me, are we in the ultimate now? Because we've seen in the applications recently, we saw the driverless cars with Tesla. They have an accident, a fatal accident with a driverless car, where the car, because of the lighting from the sun, the sensors couldn't pick up a truck in front of the car. We saw about being used in terms of mistaking kangaroos and signs on the roads. And even with Google search, targeting black people as gorillas. So this is some of the issues that we're struggling through right now, but I'm sure that would all be resolved in time and we're getting better as we move along. So where we are, are we with AI automation and on work? A very recent report from the International Federation of Robots from last year, it says we're already approaching the two million mark in the use of industrial robots. I'm not talking about software, software automation, I'm talking about industrial robots. And that's going to grow up to four million by 2020. 2025 from four to six millions. So here we have questions about if we have four to five, six million robots running around in our factories, in our community, and they are not getting paid, who's actually going to be paying taxes for us? 
We have seen huge shift in manufacturing, in agriculture, in logistics, where manual and repetitive tasks are being automated. But we also see now, as I said, with the maturity of AI, for one of the very first areas, cognitive recognition, recognizing faces, people, biometrics, AI is now being actively used across those applications. In this presentation, I look at a number of reports. There are many, many reports in just the last couple of years alone, and they all talked about the impact of automation on the workforce, ranging from 38% uh, to 50%. So if you look at this chart that I've summarized from you, which came out of the McKinsey report, if you look at the bottom of the slides, it averaged between 9% to 57%. These are very recent reports of the last couple of years, ranging to very recent in this year. Uh, it looks across from jobs. So we have, even with the unit of analysis, we're moving on the maturity index from looking at sole jobs and occupations to now looking at the granular level with tasks and now to work activities. So when looking at the scope of those reports, the prediction are averaging between 40 to 50%, depending what roles those are. But if we looked again, where are the jobs that are gonna be automated? Where are they from? Mainly in the man, in the factories, across transport, manual occupations, and across the board. So with the McKenzie report, it says only 5% of all jobs will be automated. For the remaining 60% of occupations, only about 30% of their tasks could be automated. So they, and they featured a number of sectors from food accommodation to mining and other services. But with automation, what are the factors that's either going to delay or accelerate the pace of adoption for automation? So I've listed four, four factors which are relevant to our conversation today. Just because automation is feasible doesn't mean it's realistic. We've got to look at the economic constraint. What's the cost of AI adoption versus using labor that we currently have? So in terms of the cost and supply of labor across the globe, including wages. So those two and three would be two of the factors to look at, including technical feasibility, whether the technology has evolved to the state where they can be used for specific activities. And lastly, with our regulatory and social acceptance, if we look like at issues like Uber, cars, accommodation, logistics, online ordering, whether we're there to accept some of those changes and whether we have the government policies and the human structures to accept those changes. So that would, those four factors would be impacting on the rate of adoption. IDC recently did a prediction on what's going to happen. So if you look at the number of highlighted predictions that I've listed on the screen, perhaps if we look at prediction eight, intelligent robot net. By 2020, 40% of commercial robots will become connected to a, a mass of shared intelligence. Recently, I watched the movie I, Robot, where the robots were all connected to the cloud, to a central brain, a mesh. And they all control with the intelligence of a central brain. So just taking a, a snapshot from the audience, 
prediction aid. Who do you think robots will be connected through a central mesh and controlled with increased efficiency for humans? And it says by 2020, it's only three years away. So if you look at the uptake of IoT, Internet of Things, robot connected to the Internet, are they Internet of Things as well? Why couldn't they be? They are in, in connected. They're connected to a central brain. Is that feasible in three years that will be share a collective knowledge base? You think so? By three years? Why is that? Do we have the intelligence in the central brain to do that? Uh, I feel like we might very soon, yeah. So I'll let Microsoft answer the question of the next topic. But IBM Watson, is it ready? It's already connected on the cloud. Why couldn't it be that central niche? Why couldn't it be that central intelligence? It's already assisting in a number of things. So I think that's visible. So these are some of the predictions, but predictions are just predictions, and as I said before, they're based on a number of factors in terms of the rate of adoption. So looking at the strength of what we need to do to capitalize on automation, we saw that jobs are now increasingly being automated from blue collar and now moving to white collar jobs. But what is it that all robots do currently have difficulty doing? And I think that's in the third category, third category where human currently still excel in terms of creativity, capacity, collaboration, leadership. Those are things that robots still find difficult to do at this juncture. What's the impact for ICT professionals like us? I'll take a case example in the finance industry. At the turn on the 21st century, New York City hires 150,000 financial workers who trades in equity and finance trading. In 2013, it's reduced to 100,000. And you've probably seen that a lot of AI is now being used in the fintech industry, in algorithms, in providing uh, solutions or investment portfolios in finance all automatically using algorithms online. Just earlier this year, Goldman Sachs, who used to employ 600 equity traders, have reduced that by t to two, 600 to two. And they have replaced that with over 200 computer engineers. So is that a good thing for ICT, for ICT professionals? So if you look at the staffing of Goldman Sachs, some 9,000 people in Goldman Sachs, which is a third of their workforce, are computer engineers now. So ICT workers are moving into realms of traditional areas, even in financial trading. So if you'd like to know about your job, a particular profile, you can look at this website on the a ABC, uh, ABS Interactive, with data from Alpha Beta. So I've done that recently. There was a feature on AI on ABC, and uh, this is the website uh, with the technology that was uh, online for a couple of days now. I did that for programmers, for system analysts. What's the chances that robots and automation will replace programmers, system analysts in the near future? And it came back that only 17% of the roles of ICT programmers and business analysts will be replaced with 83% which robots will have difficulty in duplicating. So these are the functions uh, that we're looking at. So you can go online and do that in a particular case, in a scenario, 
Um, and uh, so this is probably the latest AI in terms of the where we are. So looking to the future, robots are not coming. They are here. The change is here. It's not going to happen overnight. The natural work is going to evolve. And it's a question of not when the robots are here. I think the question is now, how do we humans work with robots? And I think that's a quick, good question for today. And looking at a quote from one of our futurist speakers, you be paid in the future based on how well we work with robots. So top tips for professionals moving forward. You are the innovators. You're working in the industry. You make things happen. Looking ahead, you need to keep ahead of what's happening. ICT, AI robot work with data. With machine learning, data underpins most of the functions of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we all as ICT programmers are trained to work with data, but it becomes so much more and more important as we move forward with AI. So in conclusions, most workers will be impacted by AI. The roles will change, but new jobs will be created. The jobs in the future will be different, but one of the things that currently robots will have difficulty in is understanding the human nows, what it means to be human. So one of the examples that I like to highlight before concluding is in the mining industry with Rio Tinto. The CEO recently spoke about that his next competitors are technologies working in mining, using data to find the, the next discovery for gas or oil. And it's with the usage of AI and technology that's where his competition is coming from. So if you look at what we've got to do in getting ourselves geared up for this time. Our teaching, our curriculum, our universities, what do we need to do in order for our teaching institutions to help us to adapt with the change, moving to transform our workforce? Government definitely has a role to play, and it's an important role to play in policies and to help us with a regular framework to assist with our transformation. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for this very quick presentation. Uh, it's a 20 minutes overview of the area. So from my presentation, we are in good space as technologies. We're driving the evolution, and I think the future is bright, regardless of what's been commented about doom and gloom, AI, there's a role to play. Yes, there are issues with ethics about AI and the beneficial aspects of technology, but uh, that's a discussion for another day which we'll be doing in Melbourne next week. So on that note, thank you.